Hey guys, welcome to Sandals Church where we are all about this vision of being real. And if you wanna take that vision a little bit deeper or maybe you're wondering what does that vision look like in my life, head on over to sandalschurch.tv where you can find all things sandals and get all that info. Thanks so much for joining us today. Hope you enjoyed the message. All the second stage tanks now pressurized. T minus 15 seconds, guidance is internal. 12, 11, 10, 9. Ignition sequence start. 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Zero, all engine running. Liftoff, we have a liftoff, 32 minutes past the hour. Isn't that incredible? We're not gonna call it Fres No, it's now called Fres Yes, amen? Man, super excited, look, Who would have thought 20 years ago when God said, I want you to plant a church, he would give us a vision to literally see 500 churches planted in a time in which people are turning away from God, God is giving us the ability to allow them to turn back to him. Here's the great news in Fresno. That campus is debt-free. We've had people step up. It's not gonna cost us anything. People have put money out there. They've given offerings, and we're so excited to do this. So let's just praise God for that. Isn't that incredible? Absolutely incredible. Look, God is doing amazing things. People are literally saying, hey, take this church, take this building, take this property, and use it for the glory of God. And let me tell you something. There's something special in your life when you say, God, take this. Take this, I'm no longer gonna manage it my way, I'm gonna give it to you. And whether it's a church building, your finances, or your soul, God handles with care those things that are entrusted with him. We're in a series called Loneliness, man. We live in a culture where people are more isolated than ever. Like we're more digitally connected, but we're more intimately, literally disconnected and personally isolated than at any time in human history. And I don't know where you are today, but some of you feel very alone. You're surrounded by people, but you feel all by yourself. And I wanna talk today about how God can help you overcome your loneliness. And one of the things God does to help us overcome our loneliness, I want you to write this in your notes, is he gives you purpose. You see, when you're doing something you feel like you're supposed to do, it doesn't matter who goes with you. Like, for example, if you go for a walk, but you're trying to lose weight, it's okay to walk alone, isn't it? It's okay, because you have a purpose. If you're driving to work alone, it's okay, because you know you gotta get there. It doesn't bother you to be in your car by yourself. Matter of fact, most of you wanna be by yourself in your car, because you gotta get where you gotta go. And so God helps us overcome our loneliness when we have a sense of purpose. Many of you guys have no sense of purpose in your life. And the world's not helping. The world's just saying, well, be happy. Well, that doesn't help, because I don't know what makes me happy. Well, I got good news. I know what makes you happy, and his name is God, and he loves you, and he wants to bless you and give you purpose. We're gonna look at one of the most amazing passages in the entire Bible today. Some of you have ideas of what you think what God is like. There's a reason we need God's word, because our thinking can be off, our feelings can be wrong, and the world can be confusing, and that's why God has to reveal to us who he is and what he's like, and he's gonna do that today in Isaiah chapter six. But let me just begin by praying over you and asking that God would reveal himself to you and you would understand how he can help you overcome your sense of loneliness. Father, we pray in the name of Jesus that your spirit would be present. God, that you would move. Some of us are so desperately lonely today. Many of us don't like our jobs. Many of us are unhappy with our lives. Many of us, Lord, are unhappy with our friendships, God, and and we we need purpose today. We need meaning today. We need to feel like our life matters and that it's making a difference. And God, I want you to help us understand how you wanna give us meaning, you wanna give us purpose. You wanna help us get through the mundane, the boring, and even some of the isolated parts of life. So speak to us today and help us to understand how you are our cure for loneliness. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Now, I'm preaching out of the word of God, out of the Bible, but you have all the notes in front of you 
But if you have your Bible with you, you can open up to Isaiah and notice that Isaiah starts in chapter one, but we're gonna start in chapter six. And I'm gonna get to that in a minute. But we're gonna look at Isaiah chapter six, verse one. It says, it was the year King Uzziah died. Now you don't know who he is because you're from the present and not from the past. Do you know that no matter where you go in the world, everybody knows who Donald Trump is? It doesn't matter where you are in the world, everybody knows what Coca-Cola is, everybody knows what Snickers is, everybody knows what Pringles are, and everybody knows who Donald Trump is. Because whoever is the most powerful leader at the time, everybody knows. So thousands of years ago, everybody knew who Uzziah was. He was the king. And so we get tired of our presidents every four years. Write this down. King Uzziah had ruled for over 50 years. Think about that. If you're under 50 years old, you've never known another leader. You've had one leader your entire life. Now, here's the thing you need to know about King Uzziah. He was a good leader. Here's the scary thing you need to know about King Uzziah, okay? He was 16 years old when he became king. Some of you 16-year-olds are scared about your driver's test. Can you imagine? Not only are you gonna drive a car, but you're gonna drive this nation. You're gonna be in charge. You're gonna be in charge of everything. You're gonna rule, right? You're gonna rule. And so King Uzziah became king at 16. Now, I got good news for you. He had a good mama. Amen, mamas? And his mama helped him. His mama guided him, and King Uzziah became a great king. But like a lot of kings, he became arrogant. And he said, I don't just wanna be king, I also wanna be the high priest. And you can't do both, there's only one who did. His name is Jesus. He is both our king of kings, our lord of lords, and he is our high priest. He's both, and, and King Uzziah said, I'm gonna be both. And God said, oh, no, 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 you don't. And so he went into the temple, he went into the house of worship, and he grabbed the holy instruments, and as he placed his hands on them, God struck him with a disease called leprosy. Now, praise God, you live in a modern world where most of you will never come in contact with leprosy. It's a terrible disease, and it's highly contagious. So when you get leprosy, even if you're the king, guess what they do with you? They isolate you. So here's King Uzziah. He's the king of all people, but he lives by himself. He's alone his whole life. But he lives a long life, and he becomes a great king, and he dies. It was in the year King Uzziah died, underline this, that I saw the Lord. Sometimes your world has to unravel for you to meet God. You see, some of you, you're cruising along, you thought your marriage was fine and your spouse just left you. Sometimes your world has to fall apart for you to find God. Some of you, you think your kids are great. Oh, my kids aren't like their kids. You thought your kids were fine until you find out your kids aren't fine. Sometimes your king has to die for you to see God. Sometimes you're like, well, I've never lost my job. We've always been great. And all of a sudden you find out your company's downsizing, moving away. You've been outsourced. Sometimes your world has to unravel financially for you to find God. I want you to notice here, Isaiah meets God. Think about this, Christians. This is scary in chapter six, not chapter one. You know what that means? You can go to church. You can serve in ministry. You can do great things and never meet God. You ever see on the news, you hear about these pastors who do things, these priests who do things, and you say, how on earth could they? Because they haven't met God. Oh, they're serving God, but they don't know God. Isaiah meets God in Isaiah chapter six, and it takes his life completely unraveling for him to fully understand and comprehend who God is. It was the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord, and he was nothing like he thought. You see, most of you have the wrong picture of God in your minds, and that's why we need God's word, because God's word gives us an accurate picture of who God is. It says he was sitting on a lofty throne. You see, some of you think God's your buddy, God's your king, and you didn't elect him, he's elected you. You see, we elect our president. God has elected you. He is redeeming his elect. He is calling his elect. He has chosen you. You didn't choose him. That's God. God's in control. You're not. He sits on the throne, and there isn't room for your butt. He was sitting lofty on the throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. You know what that means? There's no room for anything but God in worship. And you know what our problems is when we come to churches? We're too full of ourselves and too empty of God. And that's what Isaiah experiences. I came into worship. I thought I was a God follower. I thought I was right with God. I came in and I realized there's no room for anything but God in worship. And the problem is we shove everything else in worship. I want you to underline this word, attending. 
attending, we're gonna come to this later in the service, but attending him were mighty seraphim. They're serving the Lord. You, you, you see this worship service, you see God Almighty, and you say, why on earth with, would God who has everything need anything? Listen to me, your service isn't about God's need, it's about your calling. If the angels serve God, why can't you? Well, I'm too busy. Are you a mighty seraphim? And some of you are like, well, what's a seraphim? I don't know what a seraphim is. Look, man, there are all kinds of things we don't even know as human beings. We are so arrogant. We don't even know what's in the ocean, much less what's in heaven. They're constantly discovering new species that were extinct. Oops. They don't put that in the book. Oops. Not dead, still alive, still swimming. There it is. We're discovering new species all the time. We don't know what's on earth, much less what's in heaven. There are seraphim. There are beings that we don't understand. There are things that we can't comprehend. And some of these beings are called seraphim. Let me give it to you in the Hebrew, which is how the Bible was written. It's not written in English. It's written in Hebrew. And so it's translated seraphim. Let me tell you what it means. This is creepy. If you translate it literally, here's how you would translate it. Burning ones. Just this fire that's alive. Think about that. This fire that's alive. They're not on fire. They are fire. Do you understand what I'm saying? Attending him were mighty seraphim, powerful, scary, terrifying. This is why in the Bible, when you meet an angel, the angel's first words are usually, don't be afraid. Do you know why that is? Because you just peed yourself. That's why. Don't be afraid. Attending him were mighty seraphim, each having six wings. They don't look like Care Bears. They don't poop rainbows. They don't drop fairy dust. Each having six wings. A six-winged angel with two wings they cover their faces. Do you know why not even the mighty seraphim can look God in the face? When Moses said, God, I wanna see you face to face in the Bible, And Moses is known for the only person to ever see God face to face. Do you know what the Bible actually says? When God passed by Moses, God put his hand over Moses so that his glory wouldn't kill Moses. There's only one who's ever known God face to face. And in your Bibles, in John 1, 1, it says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was God, and the word was with God. In the Greek, it's proston theon. Let me give it to you in English. Face to face forever with God. There's only one who can look into the face of God the Father and not drop dead, and his name is Jesus. Even the mighty seraphim, they can't look at God. They cover their faces. With two, they cover their feet. Do you know why? Because the place in which they dwell is holy. And even the mighty seraphim are not pure enough to stand in the presence of God, and so they cover their feet. And with two, they flew. And they were calling out to each other. They're singing, they're shouting, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. Who is God? Different, other, unique. There is no one like him. That's what the word holy means. It doesn't just mean perfect. It means unusual, bizarre, totally different. Nothing like anything else in all creation. Oh my gosh, there's nothing like this. Yes, that's God. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of heaven's armies. You're like, why? Why if God is so powerful, does he have an army? Well, in the ancient world, here's how you measured a king's strength. A king's strength was measured by his army. God doesn't need an army, but he has one. And by the way, he still has an army because if you read the book of Revelations, it says that we're all heading for a great battle of all that is evil against all that is good. And I don't know why God has an army because it's over as soon as he speaks. That's unfortunate. We get dressed up for nothing, amen? God's like, it's over. Everybody's dead. The whole earth is filled with his glory. This weekend, Demi and I had a great date night. We went to the pageant of the Masters in Laguna Beach. Laguna Beach is one of the most beautiful places on earth, filled with some of the most least nice people on earth. (laughs) And we went to the pageant of the Masters, and, and you know what the pageant of the Masters does? It glorifies artists. 
I don't know if you're artistic. I don't know if you're talented. But there are just some people who, who can, with their hands, create reality that is so real it blows your mind. And, and, and not everybody's great at art. Artists, true artists are rare, once in a generation, once in a century. And there are some artists that literally, over all the hu human history, they stand out amongst all artists. And one of the things a great artist can do is simply capture how light actually reflects on things. The Bible says the whole earth is filled with his glory. You know what a great artist does? A great artist spends a lifetime capturing an event that God does every second of every day. The Mona Lisa, she's not that pretty. I've seen her. But she's famous for how the light strikes her face. God sheds light on your face every single moment of every single day because he is the great artist and he fills the earth with glory and his beauty and it shines every day. It's all around you. And for many of you, the reason you can't see God is you don't want to see God because you don't wanna see what Isaiah sees. The whole earth is filled with his glory. Their voices shook the temple to its foundations. Think about that. Think about how angels sing and angels worship and think about how sandals worships and sandals sings. Like we are the golf clapping church of heaven. If you wanna find sandals when you die and go to heaven, just listen for the quiet clappers. That was a good putt, Jesus. It was a very good putt, very good putt. Thank you, Jesus. No, no, don't, don't do that. Don't clap. <laughs> Their voices shook the temple to its foundations. Can you imagine a worship service at sandals that alerts Caltech in LA? What's going on? It's those sandals people again. They're worshiping God. I wish they would stop that. Their voices shook the temple to its foundations and the entire building was filled with smoke. I want you to think for a second. We're worshiping God. The building shakes and there's smoke everywhere. Most of you are out of here. Like you don't even care. You brought your grandma. She's old. You're leaving her. Boom. Grandma, you had your time. You're done. You're out of here. You know why Isaiah doesn't run? He can't. He's paralyzed with fear. He's overwhelmed with the majesty, with the glory, with the incredible nature of who God is. And then I said, Isaiah said, it's over. It's over. It's over. You know what scares me to death is everybody, some, every time somebody dies and they talk about their vision, oh, there was light and it was so warm. And I was so drawn to it. Do you know the Bible says Satan is an angel of light? Did you know that? Isaiah doesn't see an angel of light. He's not filled with warm fuzzies. He's filled with terror. He said, it's over. I'm doomed. I'm doomed. Listen to me. Isaiah is way better than you are. Way more faithful. Way more honest. Way more of a servant. And he sees God and he's like, I'm done. I'm doomed. Underline this, I'm a sinful man. Do you know why people reject God? Because they reject their sin. I don't have a hard time getting people to believe in God. I have a hard time getting people believing they're a sinner. Recently, Tammy and I were talking and I said, I, I wanna go back and I wanna get braces again. And here's why. When you're young, your parents pay for it. You don't do it right, you don't wear your retainer and then when you're old, you get to pay for it again. I said, babe, I, I, wanna go get my, I wanna go get my teeth fixed because this is the money maker and we gotta make sure this thing looks <laughs> spectacular. My wife's like, yeah, I think your face needs some work, so <laughs> go do it. So I go to the orthodontist and I don't know if you've noticed this, but I'm a talker. And when I'm nervous, the more nervous I am, the more I talk. And so I, I'm actually saying these words. I know you think it's ridiculous that I'm in here because my teeth aren't like jacked up. I'm sure you see like car crashes to come in here. And I'm like, I got a little fender bender up front and I bet you can fix it in five minutes and then I'm out of your way. And he's not saying anything. And what they're doing is they're taking a picture. They're taking a 3D picture of my teeth. 
And as they do this with light, a laser is hitting my teeth and it's reflecting the image back to a computer. And as they're doing this, my mouth is going up on a screen. And I'm a little nervous, I'm a little anxious. So I'm not really paying attention to the screen because my mouth's like, ah, you know, it's silly awkward. And he says, okay, we're done. And he says, I want you to take a look at this. And I look at a mouth on screen that looks like a pterodactyl. I'm like, oh man, is that, is that like a worst case scenario? Is that like, was that like the guy before me? I'm like, Who's, whose mouth is that? He goes, well, it's your mouth, Pastor Matt. I was like, it's my mouth. He goes, yeah, let's take a, let's take a look at your jaw. I'm like, ugh. My jaw's out of line. He's like, I bet you get headaches all the time. I'm like, yeah, I do. <laughs> He's like, look at your teeth. We're gonna have to correct this, this, and this. And what I thought would be five minutes and a, like a, a sucker, you know, here you go. Have some candy so you'll come back. That's why the dentist gives you candy. He says, I think it's gonna take about a year and a half to two years to fix your problem. <laughs> I walked into the orthodontist feeling so confident and then I was x-rayed and I saw my mouth for what it is. You know what my problem is? The Lord has blessed me with extraordinarily large lips. Don't look at them, just <laughs> don't, like try not to look at them but they're really big. They're really big. They're, they're oddly big, okay? And I'm pulling them back right now. I can't even <laughs> let them out. And so my lips cover up this damage, right? And so I can't see everything that's going on because there's not a lot of room for anything else but my lips. And so as they pulled it back and as they looked at it and as I was seen for what I am, I realized I am broken, broken. Listen to what Isaiah says. He talks about his lips. <laughs> he says, I'm a sinful man. He says, I have filthy lips. Isn't that interesting? Isaiah is a prophet of God. Do you know what a prophet of God does? They speak for God. So the very thing that he thinks is used for God, he finds the most offensive. I have filthy lips and I live amongst a people with filthy lips. Isaiah doesn't just see himself for who he is, he sees people for who they are. And when we come and encounter with God, we don't just see ourselves, we see each other, which is why the vision of Sandals Church is not just real with yourselves and real with God. It's real with ourselves, God, and others. We don't just need to see ourselves for who we are. We need to see each other for who we are. And we're jacked up, even those of us who are the best and think we're going in for a little fender bender. It's a miracle you're alive. He said, I'm doomed. I'm a sinful man. I have filthy lips and I live amongst a people with filthy, filthy lips. Yet I have seen the king. How is this possible that someone as broken as I am can see someone as mighty as you are? I've seen the king, the Lord of heaven's armies. Then one of the seraphim, the burning ones, flew to me with a burning coal he had taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. I want you to listen to what was just said here. The burning one goes and grabs a piece of fire that's too hot for the burning one to grab. So he gets a pair of tongs, he grabs the coal and he puts it on Isaiah's mouth. And he said, see, this coal has touched your lips. And Isaiah's like, I know, it hurts. He says, now your guilt is removed and your sins are forgiven. You say, well, wait a minute. Isaiah didn't do anything. Yeah, and neither did you. Do you know why your sins are forgiven? Because God sent his son to hell who burned for you. He burned for you to save you. Isaiah didn't do anything to save himself and neither can you. He says, now your guilt is removed and your sins are forgiven. Isn't it amazing the attack in our society on all things that make shame and guilt? We don't want people to feel guilty for anything. We don't want people to ever feel shame and yet 
our culture is more filled with shame than ever. And do you know why that is? Simply pretending it isn't real doesn't mean it's not. Every single human being knows deep down inside there's something terribly wrong. And it's because we're separated from a holy God who made us and is calling us. Then I heard the Lord asking, I want you to underline that. Many of you have questions for God. Have you ever asked what questions does God have for you? I hear people say all the time, well, I get to heaven, I got some questions that need to be answered. Can you imagine when people stand before the God Almighty who is surrounded by the burning ones? They're like, hey, Fred, you had a question. Go up to the front of the line. He's like, no, I, no, I don't. I don't have a question. No, no, Fred, I heard you your whole life. You have a question. No, I, I don't have a question. I am not gonna ask the burning one a question. Then I heard the Lord ask, whom shall I send as a messenger to this people? Who will go for us? Who will go for us? I thought there was only one God. Yeah, there is one God who is forever Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's who God is. So Isaiah said, here I am. Send me. I'll go. Let me tell you something. The moment you answer this call, you are never alone. You will never be alone again because wherever you go, God is with you because you are following the will of God. Listen to me, 22 years ago, I was in Orange County sitting in seminary, listening to all these young bucks that were gonna serve God and do great things. God was calling them to Laguna Beach, San Diego, La Jolla, Malibu, Hawaii, the Bahamas. God wants to break out revival in the Bahamas. And I thought it was so interesting that all these mighty men of God wanted to go places that everybody wanted to go. And then I heard the news about the Inland Empire, how it was the fastest growing area in Southern California. All the people are going there, but God forgot to call anybody to go there. And so my wife and I in Huntington Beach said, here we are, send us, send us. Listen, we're launching a church in Fresno. We, we, have, we have people that watch sandals from all over the world. There are now more people that watch online than sit in seats. And do you know why that is? That's what happens when God says, who will go? And you say, I'll go. I'll go. Listen to me. You don't tell God where you're gonna go. You say yes, and God tells you where to go. That's what you do, that's what you do. The problem is you, it's not God. You want God to bless your life? Put your yes on the table. Yes, God, I'll go, I'll go. Who will go for us? I said, here I am, Lord, I got a burning lip problem, but I'll go. I don't know if I'm ever gonna be able to speak again because that burning thing burnt my lips, but I'll go. What is God doing? Write this down, God is inviting me to know him. Him. The eyes of the Lord search the whole earth. Some of you think you're looking for God. You need to know God is looking for you. The eyes of the Lord search the whole earth in order to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. Not to who you think he is, but to who he is. You see, the problem is God has created us in his image, and so we've returned the favor, and we've created God in our image. Here's what I think God is like. We live in a world where we get to choose everything about our lives. Listen to me, if you're under 30, you have no idea how different your life is from the rest of us, okay? My kids don't understand commercials. They don't understand that. Dad, fast forwarded, we don't have to watch this. I'm like, well, how are we gonna know what cereal to buy? <laughs> My kids, literally, they, they don't listen to the music the DJ plays, they are their own DJ. My kids don't watch movies, they are in movies. They make their own movies. That's the world. Listen, if you're a college student today and you go to college, you can create your own major. That's old people laughing, that's what that is. I just, I don't feel like any of the 274 degrees fit exactly who I am. That's okay, we'll let you make up a major. 
And so when we make up our own music and we make up our own movies, we make up our own world and our own reality, we make up our own God and God says, you don't dare make up who I am. Isn't it interesting in a world that demands that everyone accept us as exactly who we are, we don't allow God the same favor? Oh, you get to tell God who you are, but God doesn't get to tell you who he is? You know why that is? Because you're on the throne, not God. And what that means is you're worshiping a false God because you're a terrible God. God is inviting me to know him. Write this down. You'll never hear this in the world. You're never gonna hear this on MTV, you know, music awards. You're never gonna hear this on the news. Nobody's ever gonna say this out loud. Let me tell you who God is. Write this down. God is terrifying. He's terrifying. He's scary. C.S. Lewis, when he writes the Chronicles of Narnia, he intentionally chooses a lion to play Jesus. And I'm not talking about the lions that are in San Diego Zoo that are on Prozac and are vegetarians. I'm not talking about those lions. You take your kids to San Diego, look kid, that's a, that's a, that's a lion. And the lion's like, ah, what time's yoga? Ah. You know, you've seen those lions or animals running around, the lion doesn't even care. That's not a lion. A real lion, when it looks at you, is simply thinking, maybe. God is terrifying. We're afraid of nothing today. And you know why that is? Because we live in this fake world. Like I follow on Instagram all these idiots that literally swim with sharks. Oh, I'm swimming with a shark. I'm swimming with a shark. And one day you will be food for a shark. And so I watched this video. My friend sent it to me of this guy getting into a shark cage. Well, at least he's smart. He's in a cage. He's getting in the cage. Here's the problem. They're feeding the shark. They got the shark excited. The shark jumps in the air, whoops, and falls into the cage. I'm not a genius. I know you knew that. But cages are only effective when the animal is on the outside of the cage. And this 14-foot great white shark is in the cage. And oh, by the way, there are divers in there. And you're watching all these experts go, because <laughs> what do you do? Nothing. Nothing. Do you know why there's a great white shark in the cage? And if it wants to eat, it will eat. And if it doesn't, it won't. And finally, the shark comes flying out and everybody's just waiting. Is Fred dead? I don't know. I don't know why it's Fred today. It's just Fred. I'm picking on Fred. And Fred comes out and everybody goes, oh, oh my gosh. I don't think Fred's ever gonna dive again. But God is terrifying. The scariest thing you've ever seen, I want you to remember this, God made it. Do you understand that? God made it. He made it. Our God is terrifying, for our God is a consuming fire. Why is it that the burning ones cannot approach the throne of God because an, even their fire, as mighty as it is, is burned by the fire of God. Isn't that crazy? The most powerful angels in heaven dare not look at God face to face. Our God is terrifying. I got good news, though. Our God is forgiving. Oh, thank you, Jesus. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. Can you imagine if God is as irritable as you? Right now in the middle of worship, some of you would just be going. Pff, 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 pff. God's watching us worship. He's like, where's those golf clappers? Pff, 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 pff. Some of you would come to church married and leave single. Some of you would come in with four kids, leave with two. You're like, praise God. God is good. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, but he does get angry. He does get angry. And there's a world today that says if God is love, there wouldn't be a hell. And I'm here to tell you, if God is love, there has to be a hell. Because there's a place these shooters need to go, amen? Isn't it amazing all the talk about Gun violence, nobody ever talks about consequence. Has anybody noticed that? 
No politician brings up consequence because our culture is terrified of consequence, which is part of the problem for who we are. God's not afraid to talk consequence. He actually lays it out for you. Follow me or follow that fire. That's the choice. God is inviting me to join him. My sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. I can't stand it when Christians say, well, God's just with me wherever I go. No, you're supposed to be with him wherever he goes. God doesn't follow you. God's not your dog that you take on a walk. God is your king that you follow. And here's the truth. Some of you run around pretending like you follow God. You follow your own whims, your own desires, your own passions, and you wonder why you hate your life. Jesus said you need to die to your life so you can find true life. That's what he said. God's not trying to destroy you. He's trying to save you. You're trying to destroy you. God is inviting me to join him through service. What do the seraphim do? They attend him. They serve him. They serve him. Most Christians never serve God. You feel like you're doing a good job because you showed up to church. Why don't you serve God? Why don't you do something? All of Isaiah chapter six is a worship service. Some angels have to move coal. I don't wanna move coal. I wanna fly. I wanna be the singing one. Nope, you move coal. Look, to have a worship service, there are unglorious tasks. We got parking lot attendants. We should just change the name, call them the burning ones, amen? <laughs> That's what they're doing today, so you can have a parking space, and they go left, and you're like, I'm being persecuted! They won't let me park in my parking space! I've had a week, Lord! As you sit in your car that's 62 degrees. We could lose some parking lot people today. They could just, they're gone. They wear orange, how would we know they're on fire? Each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's grace. Listen to me, God's not gonna hold you accountable for the gifts you don't have. Well, I would sing if I could sing. Well, God didn't give you the gift of singing, but he has called you to serve. He's called you to serve. God doesn't want you to go to church. He wants you to be a part of the church, which means you serve at church. That's the difference between a child and an adult. A child complains when they're asked to serve. An adult gets it. Right? Next, through worship. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Let us offer to God Underline this, acceptable worship. Well, God's just happy with whatever crap I serve. No, he's not. You know, at the end of the service, when we have an offering, God says, if you don't want to give it, he didn't want it. Let us offer acceptable worship with reverence and awe. We live in a world where we revere nothing. At Sandals Church, we worship God on the weekends in a couple ways. Number one, we sing together. You're like, I don't like singing. Just get to the word of God, pastor. Okay, I'll read a verse. I will sing to the Lord because he's been good to me. Right? God's been good to you. You know how I know? You're not dead. You're not dead. If I was God, most of you would be dead. I'm just I will sing to the Lord because he's good to me. Some of you are so mad at God and you are blessed at how good he's been to you. Next, I will listen to the preaching of God's word. What happens in this worship service? Listen to me, Isaiah is given a message. And it's a message that people aren't gonna wanna hear. You know, Isaiah has many, many famous passages, probably none more famous than these words, woe to the people who call good evil and evil good. 
That's our current culture. We shame what is good and we honor what is evil. Listen to me, so many of you are being pressured in the name of love and acceptance to reject God's word and hate him. I'm all for love and acceptance. I'm all for love. I'm all for acceptance, but not if that means we hate God's word and we reject him. You gotta make a choice. It's a difficult choice, but we have to choose. Preach the word, be ready in season and out of season. You know what that means? Sometimes preachers don't wanna preach it and sometimes you don't wanna hear it, but the preacher has to preach and we have to listen. That's what it means. Then we give an offering. Some of you don't understand this, that the offering is really the dessert of the service. It's the crescendo, it's the climax it's the most important portion of the service because it's where we all make decisions and many of you, it's when you bail. I don't know what it is about our culture that leaves right at the end. When I was a kid, when I was a kid, I went to my first NBA basketball game. I never been to a game. I'm not exaggerating. We got tickets on the, on the floor of a professional NBA game. I was sitting next to Miss California. It was hard for me to watch the game. My friend's dad made us leave the game three minutes early because he didn't want to wait in traffic and the team we were rooting for was down by eight points. We got in the car and turned the radio on and the announcer was in tears. It's the greatest game of my life. I've never seen anything like this. And I'm like, me neither. Me neither, Miss California saw it, but I didn't. What is it about our culture that we're so afraid of traffic? Some of you guys on Judgment Day, you're like, this line's too long, I'm going to hell. <laughs> it's true, I'm done. Burning is better than this. What is it about our culture? You know, Tammy and I, we went to the pageant of the masters and if you've never been, it ends with the same painting every year. Did you know that? It's been going on for decades. They end with the same painting every single year, considered one of the greatest works in all of human history by Leonardo da Vinci and it's the Last Supper of Christ. Do you know why that painting is so remarkable? Some of you have never really looked at it, but every single thing in the painting, every beam, every beam of light, every tile, every eye, every piece of fruit, every single thing in the painting is looking at Jesus. And yet people are walking away. Right at the moment when everything is pointing right to Christ, all these people are walking away. And I'm like, they must go to sandals. <laughs> See you guys. The offering is an important time. Give to the Lord the glory he deserves. You see, some of you guys drive fancy cars, but you're cheap with God. You know why that is? Because you want to sit on a throne, not God. Some of you, man, you can't drink coffee at 7-Eleven, but you give Starbucks more money than you do your king. Starbucks can't even get your order right. <laughs> Jesus Christ died perfectly on the cross for your soul. You're like, yeah, I got no money this week. Give to the Lord the glory he deserves. Bring your offering and come into his presence. Worship the Lord in all his holy splendor. We live in a culture that worships ourselves. We worship our image instead of his. Look, at the end of service, that's not the time for you to bolt, that's the time for you to give yourself a prayer, an offering, a gift. That's what it's for. Last point, this is what makes sandals unique, and I wish it didn't. I gotta go fast because you guys are listening slow. Here we go. Here's how we worship God at sandals. This is an act of worship. Some of you guys don't get this. Discussion, 
is worship. We need to have a real discussion and reflection about what God said. I want you to listen very carefully. Most commentaries, when you read commentaries on Isaiah chapter six, everything is about what God does and nothing is about Isaiah's message. We completely forget the message. Here's the sermon he's to give. God says, yes, go and say to this people, you know who that is? The people of God, the church of God, Israel of God, say to this people, listen to these words, listen carefully, but don't understand. What the heck does that mean? What it means is you can sit in church, sit in worship, hear every word and not get any word. That's what it means. Watch closely. You can watch me online and miss every point. People say, I watch you online every week. Did you hear what I said? I had a guy told me he's at the gym. He stopped me at the gym. He said, thank you, pastor, for challenging me to get married or break up. I said, you're welcome. What'd you do? You know what he said? Neither. I don't know what to do with that. Watch closely, but learn nothing. Harden the hearts of these people. Plug their ears and shut their eyes. That way they will not see with their eyes, nor hear with their ears, nor understand with their hearts and turn to me for healing. Here's what God's saying. It's a lot harder to get right than you think. And so many of you today are sitting in here saying, God, everybody needs to hear this message. And God's like, I'm talking to you. And that's why you need to be in community group where people can go, bro, you're full of crap. And people can challenge you and talk to you. And so when you say stupid things like I hate singing, people can confront that. Because your wife can't confront that. She's got to go home with you. I don't, I'll confront it. We all need that. We all need people who say, what did you hear that you didn't understand? What did you see that you're not obedient to? Everything Isaiah is preaching is meant to be discussed. Here's the thing, listen to me. If you enjoyed the message today, which I hope you did, you're gonna forget 90% of what I said 10 minutes after you leave. You know what that means? You listened carefully, but you didn't understand. Here's what the research shows. If you discuss it, you have 10 times more likely to remember what was said and change your life. Look, here's the challenge. Get real. Get in a group and pray for what God is doing in our church. Man, we're reaching thousands, but that breaks my heart if thousands of people get their life right with God, but we miss you. I don't wanna miss you. I want you to make it. I want you to get your life right with God, and some of you need to do that today. Today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray in the name of Jesus, Lord, that you would just speak in this moment. And I know, Lord, some of us are tempted. We got places to go, things to do. God, I know it's hot and parking is a pain. But God, could we just stop and listen? Could we try to understand? Could we be obedient? Lord, take our lives. Let us offer them up to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I love you, Sandals Church. God bless. Here at Sandals Church, we really do believe that this vision of being real can change the world. Because Sandals Church is a nonprofit that operates from donations from people like you. Because when you donate, your money goes to creating places for people to be real all over this world. So man, I would love for you to be a part of that. And you can make a donation today by clicking the link on this video or going to donate.se. So join us and join what God is doing through this vision of being real and have a great day.